Nikki Bra, welcome to the crib in Cyprus. What's up, Max? So, you bought a Ferrari and that <laughs> is now <laughs> on this island. Yeah, it's standing there. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how did, because Primoz and I, we were talking about this, how difficult is it to get one with where the steering wheel is on the right side? I mean, steering is on the right side here in Cyprus. So yeah, you cannot find on the left, you can find the one on the right. But so it's hard to find. In Cyprus, there's a problem, you cannot find what you want. Mm. But I was lucky because I found exactly what I wanted. <laughs> How did so you I went it? inside, actually I went into the shop um, with Crocs, obviously, <laughs> with hoodie, and uh, they don't take you seriously. Yeah. And I saw it. And I said, okay, I n this is the one, is exactly what I'm looking for. And yeah. I said, okay, uh, is it already sold? And there was uh, like a secretary, she said, no, it's still there. And I said, okay, I'll buy it. <laughs> and she was like, oh, what? And I said, yes, yes, uh, we can uh, proceed. <laughs> and, oh, wait, one second, I need to call manager. Or I need to call the owner. Then owner came, but the owner, uh, Mr. Marios, he uh, like took me seriously and mm. uh, it was fast. So no shit. It was super fast. Damn. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, a super fast. I see what you did there. Uh, okay, that's it. <laughs> but I have to say, before, for example, um, before this uh, salon, uh, I went into others, also the same style, because I don't care sometimes how I look. I just go with a pyjama and Crocs. It's uh, online entrepreneurship. Uh, yeah, like okay. uh, comfortable, most important. Yeah. And I went into stores and I said, okay, I'm interested in a car. Uh, like very expensive cars like the budget was like uh, up to half a million because it's hard to get stuff here there's nothing mm -hmm. uh, because people are chilling and they're enjoying the beach they don't need uh, stuff like this yeah uh, you know that's why um, I went into stores like this and I said uh, can you order a nice car can we import it and I said yeah yeah okay I write down I write down I will call you back but never no no one called back because some people they uh, did not take uh, me seriously but uh, here it was uh, it was a success i mean the crazy thing is as an entre as an online entrepreneur i know exactly what you're talking about you never w really wear anything extravagant if you just walk around in your regular life because yeah. you wear the things that that are comfortable when you sit in front of your laptop and you hustle exactly. Yeah, exactly. and then plus for me uh, i have a, another layer on top of that because i have tattoos uh -huh. so they're like oh who is this guy you know so and you can see them like mentally going through their checklist like okay crypto millionaire um, rock footballer rock star <laughs> crazy okay interesting but then you know like it's funny as it really sounds as 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 superficial as it sounds uh, having a nice watch really helped for me at least. I remember I w I would be in in airport lounges all the time and people would always look weirdly at me like who who let this guy in. And then once I had a, a little bit nicer watches, they're like ah okay well there's probably some crypto dude you know. Uh, it's really funny but uh, you know I'm glad I'm glad you got the glad you got the car man and you got a an F1 exhaust. Yeah that's true. <laughs> it's I mean what the technicians uh, told me it's the loudest legal car. Mm in uh y european union damn man. so when i came here i told max uh, you know the police pulled me over <laughs> off, obviously <laughs> so uh, it's what unavoidable sometimes did they ask you what you do for a living were they suspicious were they like who the fuck is no this the officer was pretty nice yeah <laughs> <laughs> he was a cool dude oh man that's so funny i remember i had a friend of mine <clears throat> andre he's a professional poker player he was uh I don't I don't know where, what he is right now, but back then he was top four supernova elite in the world in his in his bracket for um, these sit and goes that he would play, and so he was like twenty when I used to hang out with him back in the days in Vienna, and he bought himself uh, a brand new Audi. It was like eighty k or something with like all kinds of extra modifications mm -hmm. and stuff like that, and then he would park in uh, um, in you know like restricted parking area in Vienna, and we would we would come out of my house. And there was three police officers standing around his car and, you know, writing down his license plate. And they're like, hey, you know, do you know you're in restricted parking? And he's like, oh, well, you know, I'm sorry. Um, I'm happy to pay, you know, and they write the paying thing. And they're like looking at the car. They're looking at him. He's 20 years old. They look at how he reacts to having to pay a parking ticket, like not caring. Because back then he made like two and a half million in profit just from playing poker. And they're like, uh, oh, so this is your dad's car. And he's like, what? No, it's my car. And then they're like this is your car you bought it he's like yeah i bought it new like last month he's like and then the police officer was like <clears throat> what do you do for a living and he was like with all due respect sir i don't have to answer that question <laughs> <laughs> point star <Yeah. laughs> well the officer also asked is it your car I said yes it's mine but i think he's obliged to do it but then i needed uh, to show like documents insurance <clears throat> and stuff <throat> and he saw it's mine 
Interesting. Well, look, let's backtrack a little bit. So for the fellows that don't know you, you're very, very known in the German-speaking market. Um, we have an international audience here, so not everybody is going to know. So from my perspective, you are the guy behind my physical transformation over the last almost one and a half years now. Um, you're the reason why I transitioned from being a vegetarian for over 12 years into a quote-unquote successful meat eater uh, very, um, and also have to say very, um, uh, very healthy meat eater. I transitioned into it in a very, very healthy way. And uh, you're literally helping people like me, busy people, entrepreneurs, people who have the money, but not a lot of time, but they still want to get the best out of life from a hormonal standpoint, as well as a fitness standpoint. People call you the God of hormones for a reason. Um, what, how, how do you, how do you describe yourself? Well, it's hard to describe because uh, my clients uh, range from A to Z, meaning I work with uh, professional athletes, NBA, UFC, German Bundesliga, like the top of the top. Um, I work with uh, pregnant women. They need help uh, before, during, after pregnancy. Uh, basically lots of medical conditions where I can help and also lots of entrepreneurs who want to get healthier, get more energy. For example, Max, uh, when you came, your testosterone was like very low, mm -hmm. four. Um, we boosted it to 30, naturally. Like almost 10x. Almost 10x. How crazy is that? Within uh, like maybe 12 months. Mm. So obviously this uh, transfers into higher energy levels, into being more productive, more mm. confident and so on. So this is mainly why entrepreneurs come to me. Um, because I can analyze blood work, I tell them what to measure, uh, I receive the results, um, I analyze them, I know how to, op how to optimize nutrition, training, lifestyle, and all the small details and mm. supplementation um, to achieve uh, testosterone boost naturally without using any s forbidden substances. Mm. Um, because many people, they have a wrong perception that they think hormones or god of hormones or uh, we increase his testosterone that is connected to injections or to using testosterone. But actually what I do for people is we increase it naturally. So we are not using any stuff that mm. you should not do. And I'm not a fan of it. I will never give or advise anyone to take any injections or any exogenous testosterone if he's not a professional athlete. Mm. Professional athletes, they need to do it. Mm. And also some professional athletes come to me because I also know what I'm doing in this sphere. Mm. Um, but for normal people, for entrepreneurs, for pregnant women, <laughs> it's not necessary. So yeah, my clients range from A to Z, like from professional athletes to overweight women yeah. to super rich entrepreneurs, so um, online and offline. So yeah, I have a wide range. And so far I'm doing this for more over, this is like my 16th year, my 16th season, you could say. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, over 15,000, over 16,000 even clients from Damn. all kinds of uh, spheres and niches, situations, medical conditions. Um, I'm not a magician that can heal uh, uh, everything in the world, but um, I can help with a lots of stuff because everything, not everything, but most complicated situations are based on blood work because I can pinpoint where it's coming from. Mm. For example, when you uh, started, when we started to do tr the transition from vegetarian to normal healthy eating, the first thing we have done with blood work so I can see. Mm. But it's not necessary to do blood work for all of people because some situations are just standard. But here again, blood work is very cheap. It's like, mm. especially you travel a lot and in some countries it's like 50 bucks maximum. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. it's like you take, and I recommend to take blood work two times per year. So it's like 100 bucks per year and you get an overview of your situation of your health, which yeah. is very important. Because if you don't know, how you know you're healthy or not? Because feeling uh, yeah. is like subjective. Yeah. I even got it just before you, like a couple hours before you came. Uh, I scheduled my next blood work because I always want to see it. And for me, it's always like, uh, like a little bit of Christmas. Like you unpack the package and you see <laughs> the testosterone got even higher. You know, it's always nice. It I, will be hard to get even more than thirty-one. <laughs> <laughs> so I cannot promise to get thirty-three. If we get twenty-nine, it's already good. Hell yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> I got a feeling. I'm feeling even better now. Oh and shit. 
I've just met I've just met a if guy. If it's 40, we need to make a new video. <laughs> I'm down, I'm down. I met a guy, Chan, he's also a client of yours. He you helped him get off steroids. Also, uh, also tattooed guy, uh does um I think he's he's a Rolex um, a reseller or something like that. Great guy. Also, he had yeah, only only good things to say about you. Really cool. And it, it's funny because it's like um, what I've kind of noticed. It's almost like a it's like a subculture that you've created. Like so many times, I run into people, and uh, they're online entrepreneurs. They're jacked. They're fit. And they're like, oh yeah, I'm, oh you also Nicky Brock Klein, bro. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. Like wherever you go, there's like somebody knows you or is even your client. And it's really funny. It's like almost just like, yeah, you even call yourself like Nikki Bra Army, I think. Well, it's really cool. I was in Croatia a couple of months ago. And you know me, I do not see all these things because yeah. I'm working a lot in front of the computer all the time. I'm analyzing uh, all the data. I'm analyzing the blood work. I'm analyzing all my clients' weeks. So I don't see what's happening on social media. I don't see this, um, <clears throat> yeah, what's, what's going on all around in this bubble. Yeah. So I was in Croatia. And there was one guy who became a client uh, the same week. And he said, you know what? There's like a group, like a fitness group in Germany that's so big. And they always refer, for example, if they ask questions. And they always say, no, Nikki Brothers not allow it. And they are no clients. They're like just like loyal followers. They follow my philosophy. And they're like teaching people, no, Nikki Bra says no. And Nikki Bra says yes. And I'm not aware of it because I'm sitting in front of the computer. I don't know all these underground groups. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think this was kind of funny because I'm not aware of all of this, what's happening yeah, yeah. all around. For example, I don't know what client knows what client most of the time because there are so many. Mm. But yeah, there's like already like um, small, oh, I mean small. I think in the fitness, especially German fitness, is like the biggest. Yeah, I I, I would definitely say so. It's uh, the biggest. I would definitely say so. And you know, it's such a you know, it's funny. Like, I consider myself such a simple man. Like, all I want out of life is to make good money. I don't even need to make a lot of money. You know, like a couple million a year is fine enough for me. Like, I want to be able to go wherever I want. And not look at the price. I want to buy whatever I want and not look at the price. That's I have a like, question for you. How many million you need in your pocket that you say, okay, it's enough? That's a good question, man. That's why I'm so I'm saying I don't even. I've never thought about it that way. I'm thinking about it less in terms of in my pocket and more in terms of a yearly income. Or well, what you would say, where you could live on comfortably without saying, okay, I need to worry about anything anymore. I already have that right now, and I've already had that when I crossed, I think, the three, four million a year mark. But the thing is, it's not even like the reason why I want to keep pushing is not even because I want to make more money so I can feel more comfortable. It's more like it's literally almost like a video game for me at this point. I'm like, oh, that's the high score. Like, I want to crack the high score. Mm. So, so what we're working on right now, and I've told you this earlier, we, we were shooting YouTube videos for your YouTube channel. Shameless plug, check it out. Um, <laughs> I'm like, we, we are about to crack a million a month. That's like our goal now. And that's not it's not even like, I want to crack this so I can then buy XYZ. It's more like- It will I, not make a difference for you personally, <laughs> exactly. but you will reach a new high score. Exactly. I just want to be like, yo, I want to make a million a month. I want to, because I know it's possible. So why wouldn't I do it, right? This is actually very connected mindset to my coaching and in general, my philosophy, because um, it should be a little bit like gamification. It's exactly. called like psychologically gamification. So for example, you want to reach new heights in your gym. It needs to be like a game mm -hmm. exactly. because gaming, uh, it's just like a um, human endeavor. Like people need to game and have fun and play yeah. in their life. Hell if yeah. they don't play, if they don't have fun, it's boring and it's sad and it's depressive. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be successful, in my opinion, you need to make a game out of it. Exactly. That's why, for example, the worksheets that I give and all this system that I like weekly give to the people um, and adjust weekly, it's like a video game exactly. more or less. And uh, that's why it's fun because then you see, aha, new goal reached, like new level unlocked yeah. and so on. New measurements, testosterone, 5X, 10X. It's like a game, you know? Exactly. Then it's fun. Then it's easier also to to stick with it, to cope with it also. It, it, exactly. Like... Uh, I literally get this feeling like every Thursday, I literally have it on my Trello. It's like um, Nikki Bra checkup. It literally says that. And um, for me, it's like, it's such a satisfying feeling when I quote unquote submit 
a perfect week of like macro hit, 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 weigh myself every day, uh, 10K steps every day. And it's all like, it's just like a nice sheet that I filled out 100%. So it's almost like you get 100% in a video game or, you know, you level up in Diablo or something like that. Yeah. That's how it felt. And it's really funny because um, I thought about this concept so often lately, this whole idea of like, why do we humans love games? Why do we love this so much? And Hideo Kojima, the maker of uh, Death Stranding and uh, Metal Gear Solid, great freaking guy. One In of Metal my... Gear Solid, there's a weapon that's called Nikita, no? Exactly, exactly. Oh my God, I forgot about that. The one where you could shoot the rocket and you could steer the rocket. Uh, yeah. My parents uh, named me after yeah. this rocket. <laughs> <laughs> So Hideo Kojima, he has this concept. I literally know this because I have his merch. He says, we turn from Homo sapiens, the knowing, to Homo ludens, the playing. Mm. And that's what we're doing. And, and I honestly think this is because, genetically speaking, we have survived through war. So we are a species that is, quote-unquote, it's a very harsh word, addicted to war and the competitive aspect of it. And nowadays, of course, because we live largely, thank God, in a peaceful society, the war that we're doing is the war on video games. Like, we need this competition. That's why we love uh, being in a stadium watching a soccer game. And, you know, what do people do is like, are they, are they, what noises are they making? They're like, yeah! It's like these war cries. And also that we're feeling making. together, like all together exactly. with the same feeling. Exactly. Like so, on a concert or something. Exactly. Or, and that's what this gamification really does is it hijacks our part of our brain mm -hmm. that is already naturally there. We love resonating with the idea of competition, of togetherness, of us versus them, of a higher goal that we're achieving together, of this whole competing. Like, you either are competing against another team team or an opponent or about uh, you competing against yourself yeah and that's really cool like we humans we kind of need this this competition we need this gamification because like you said it makes things hell of a lot easier and one of the things also that really hooked me back in the days on on business was i had built a, a brand with my first uh coaching business the dating coaching business mm -hmm. and uh i was always super addicted to video games like diablo final fantasy uh, all these, all these strategy games, Command and Conquer, and I, I would love that so much. I would, uh, World of Warcraft, Counter Strike. I played Counter Strike Source semi-professionally with a clan. We had like every Tuesday, we had to show up to the server and go train and stuff like that. It was really crazy. And then I kind of realized, um, once I started th this this coaching business, I was already traveling. I think I was on my second or third world tour, and uh, I would start constantly checking my stats. I would check my subscribers. I would check my followers. I would check the money that came in overnight. And I'm like, this literally feels like a video game. Mm. It literally feels like Sim City, where I'm checking how many houses I have and how gr how big the city grew. And then I'm like, holy shit, this is l I'm addicted to business because it literally is like a video game. The only difference is that I'm not gathering fictitious pieces of gold or fictitious high score points. I'm gathering real life dollars. And with these real life dollars, I can allow myself to travel around. I can, you know, give back to my parents. I can donate stuff, and or I can buy nicer stuff for myself. And that's really cool. Like I got, I got really hooked into that. Um, so that's beautiful. And I also know that you used to play a lot of video games, right? What What are your favorite video games? Final Fantasy. I think the biggest like, ones? top five. Okay, okay, okay. That's difficult. Okay, <laughs> top five. I know it's difficult, <laughs> but it's interesting. Metal Gear Solid. Because of Nikita, the record. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that sh that changed my life. Like. Metal Gear Solid 1, I watched my brother play it when I was like freaking six years old. But it was on PlayStation. I no? was on PS1, uh -huh. exactly. Then Metal Gear Solid 2 on PS2 was the first game I played myself amongst the first ones. Metal Gear Solid 3 on PS3, I think it was, or on PS2, I can't remember. I think if the 3 was on PS2. Metal Gear Solid 4. I mean, I cried at the end of these games because they're... I love the story. I love everything about it. And then honestly, also Death Stranding, which I so strongly recommend you. People have criticized a little bit as a walking simulator, but Death Stranding, like, everything Hideo Kojima does is just such genius game making. I really, really cannot recommend it enough. Um, so I would say Metal Gear Solid is top. Then I would say Death Stranding. Then I would say Final Fantasy. But with Final Fantasy, it's difficult because they're vastly so different. Uh, I played 10. Final Fantasy 10 was one of the craziest games. I had, it was the first game I had 250 gaming hours, playing hours. <laughs> you know, there goes my teenage years. 250 hours of Final Fantasy. Um, and then... Um, um, that's actually a good question. Command and Conquer. I used to play a lot in Counter-Strike. I used to play a lot. Just playing, just hours-wise, I would say. 
What about you? Uh, I mean, the game I played the most was Counter Strike 1.6 mm. because I was uh, my man. I also like semi professional. I made some money with it. I was no pretty hell, successful. Hey. I was in uh, the ESL, the Electronic Sports Yo, League in me Germany. Me too, man. <laughs> I, I was number one in many ladders there, one on one, two on oh, two, five map dang. ladder, A map, and so on. So I was pretty successful there, and like for me, it was competition. Yeah, yeah. So I was like 14 years old, and I was making money there, and uh, from this money, I bought a better computer and so on. So I invested lots of time in this, and luckily, uh, I most of my teammates uh, back in the day, um, like I said, we played in a very high league, and we were a very good team, and. Um, I'm still friends with them. And I was like 14, 15 ish, and they were 18 plus. So yeah. they were like grown men. So yeah. I was like in a bubble of grown men, and uh, they were harsh on me. Mm. And they said, uh, shut the fuck up, kitty, and play. <laughs> and uh, why is your your uh, voice, voice so high and so on? <laughs> uh, uh, install a voice changer, we can hear you, and so on. So they were harsh on me. It was a competition, but. Uh, I know it was like a uh, very, very good team and mm. uh, I'm still in contact. Some of them became my clients. That is so sick. Uh, it, was, still in uh, it, it was a good time because uh, even though it's just a video game, uh, I was there, uh, like it was very competitive. Uh, but also, um, yeah, Counter-Strike 1.6 most likely is number one uh, time that I invested. Mm. But I used it... Um, more as a relaxation still yeah. from sports real mm, life sports mm. um but still i was very successful in mm. counter-strike but uh, other games let's say number one is counter-strike and uh, i like mafia one a mm. lot mm. i played it i like the story i like gta vice city because oh, of the style the you vibes know, the vibes i like the music Hell espantoso yeah. and <laughs> i really like it i played vice city uh, also a lot great game um I like in, like in the past years I did not play that much because I don't have that much time obviously yeah. Yeah. but there was a game I really like which was Kingdom Come Deliverance mm. it's like it's a not, not not a known game but it's like mafia or GTA but in the medieval time so you're yeah. like uh, knight or you're like yeah, in, yeah, in medieval yeah. times so you have your horse and you have your sword mm. uh, and so on so it's very realistic I me I did not like that much fantasy games I really like realistic games where yeah. it's like historical, where you can learn from. This yeah. is what I like. Mm, I got my first computer when I was five or six. Damn. And I started to play. I was never a console player like PlayStation. No console I play, peasantry here on this team. <laughs> PlayStation, I played a little bit like Tekken or oh, Crash Bandicoot 3. It was oh my um, God, most yes. likely my favorite game. It's like Crash Bandicoot. But most of the time I was like computer gamer. Like... Uh, mm. At the age of five or six, I was playing already like Age of Empires, also yeah. Command and Conquer, yes. Duke Nukem, Doom, Duke Unreal Nukem. Tournament. I know everything. I, I was a hardcore gamer too, but I was a hardcore gamer, yes, but I was more hardcore in real life sports. Yeah. So all of the um, online stuff or the computer stuff, it was only to find the balance. Mm. To only to find the balance because... Uh, and in my opinion, back in the day, the games were mentally like challenging. Mm, they were, agree. Um, agree. you needed to think because maybe not everyone will agree, but uh, back in the day, the games, they were made for students or let's say intelligent people, smart people that yeah. could think uh, properly. So games were more interesting, more challenging. Nowadays, I think the games uh, go more towards to like uh, stupid school kids, I no offense, but uh, it's like much easier, just more animations, better graphics, but uh, it's like I auto mean, scroller. Yeah, uh, you would also like you don't need to think that much. You would also get constantly rewards for everything because yeah. they want to they want to dopamine hit you every yeah, time. Yeah. So, I mean, I remember they want you to come back. Exactly. Back in the day, they were for example, sorry to interrupt you. Oh, good. I remember there was a Mafia 1 mission with the race uh, I don't know how many weeks. Uh, my cousin, <laughs> my cousin called me and said, "Come, you need to make this mission for me. At uh, two weeks, <laughs> yeah. I cannot pass the mission." Exactly. Nowadays, uh, the kids uh, with ADHD, they, yep. if they don't pass a mission two times, uh, that's it, they quit the game. Back exactly. in the day, there were missions that were hardcore. 
They were hardcore. I mean, I re- I remember you like racing games. Like you know, you would lead a whole race, and then whatever lap twenty out of twenty, you crash. That's it. Buy, you lose. Nowadays, you can rewind. Yeah, you true. rewind. Like, oh, let me true. do this corner one more true, time. True, you know. True. So yeah, it's you know, and, and you know, it's funny. Like so many modern games, they're like ultra hype. Then they come out, and I'm like, well, I, I'll buy it. It's and then I play, and I'm like, what is this? It's not even fun. It looks good though, it like the graphics. Good, it does, but I'm like, I don't, know, I don't know. It doesn't hook me as it used to. And then I'm always asking myself, is it just me growing up, or or are just games not as cool as they used to be? I think but, both. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably. Um, it's funny that you said like for you it was always the real life sports. Like I'm, I have become increasingly more and more sporty of a person over the years. Like literally every single year, uh, I was not sporty at all. I, I was a fat kid. I was a chubby kid. Um, and the thing that really changed m- my approach to sports was the Austrian army, mm. the military. Because How many years? Just six months. Mm. That's all it took. And because, like, you know, I come there, like, a very sedentary lifestyle. Um, I was a metalhead back then. So for me, it was all just, like, playing music, drinking beer, playing guitar, listening to metal. There was no – I wasn't going running. Hell no. Nah. <laughs> I wasn't doing a gym. What the hell? No way. And then you go to the army and they're like, you know, every single morning, like seven days a week, 6.30 a.m. sports, mm. right? So, like, you're literally forced to get better at this. And then, and then I remember I got out of the army and I'm like, I need to do sports. I, I feel bad if I don't. Like my body kind of got hooked on the, on the, on the rewards that 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 sports just gives you in terms of like how you feel, and and ever since then I've never looked back to a sedentary lifestyle anymore. Like, sure I like relaxing, and sure I like you know chilling on the couch as much as the next guy. But if I don't go to the gym, I if I don't do heavy lifting, if I don't move, um, at least three times a week, I just feel bad. I don't sleep as well. I'm not as focused, and I feel like I have all this weird excess energy that needs to get out, and I can't even, I, I can't do anything. It, it, it like it needs to be out there, and um, it's funny because this was this because you mentioned like for you Counter Strike was a balance to the to the sports thing that you did in real life. For me, sports right now is a big balance that I do to business. It's like I'm, you know, what I do is so head heavy like brain heavy Mm -hmm. i have to think i need to make decisions and then at the gym i can shut my brain off and then i just lift and um funny enough this is really like the only time where i really listen to music Mm -hmm. i I know some people they listen to audiobooks when they lift but i'm like no way i can't Mm -hmm. do that i want to just blast some heavy metal i listen to like a metallica album or something like that and and then i just lift and it really makes me feel really good mentally do you how does I mean you're literally you've made sports not only your something that you do for your body but it's literally your profession mm-hmm. it's something that you've built you have a reputation around it. it it's the one thing that is that is financing your entire life what is what is por- sports for you on a personal level it's part of my life because I've been doing sports also s- like since since I don't know age five damn so it's impossible for me not to do sports and lifting for example in the gym is uh, i'm not i'm doing sports since five but gym i'm not doing since five so i did uh, martial arts i did basketball i played basketball on a high level in germany this was like my main sport but Mm -hmm. i could not i could continue but i saw it's nonsense to continue after my youth years because I need to play with men's division and men's division I'm just not tall enough I'm not two meters Mm. that's why it's nonsense to invest time in it I played in men's division during my youth years so as a youth I played in men's Mm. but I knew that okay I even if I become a professional I will sit on the bench so for me it's nonsense to train two times per day take 1000 shots and then sit on the bench and make no money Mm. this is nonsense um, that's why I quit basketball. But um, yeah, gym in general is the best when it comes to um, releasing stress mm. um, as a balance from work. It's always available because you come to Cyprus, you have a gym, you go to Japan, you have a gym, mm-hmm. but it's not like this with basketball. Mm. You cannot go to Japan and just have a basketball workout uh-huh, anywhere true, you want. True. And also the 
metabolic and hormonal benefits are excellent. This you do not get with, let's say, other sports that much. But with a gym, you have like a bundle of benefits that you get. Yeah. You have psychological benefits because you release stress. You have time for yourself. Uh, you get like mentally rewarded with dopamine after your workout that you start to feel good because you have done some stuff. Mm. Um, but also the hormonal response. For example, your testosterone goes up. Your blood circulation improves. Um, you know, it's a full bag of benefits that you get. Mm. But also... Gym is just fun for me because workouts, I just like it. I like it. There's no specific reason, uh, like uh, scientific reason why I like it. Uh, I just like it because it's part of my life. Why I went to the gym is because I was playing basketball and my coach ah. said at 12, or, or uh, I should be like 12 and a half or 13, I was playing um, at the International School of Düsseldorf I was more or less hired because I was very good at 12 mm. um, to play there and they had a gym. And my coach said, okay, even at 12, you know, everyone is taller. And I played as a 12-year-old, I played with 14, 15-year-olds uh -huh. and so on. So, as, for example, when I was 15, 16, I already played in the men's division. Um, uh, it was everywhere. In Counter-Strike, I was 14, I played with men uh, <laughs> and, and so on. So, it's like a pattern. Anyways... Um, so he said, you need to go to the gym because you're not only younger, but you're smaller and weaker. So you need to train, you need to build muscle, you need to become faster, you need to jump higher and so on. So basically I went to the gym not to get big or have big arms or look good in the club or whatever, or to make nice selfies in the gym. Or no, I went there to become stronger, to jump higher, to run faster, so I can, um, well, so I can compete with older children so i can mm. uh so i don't need to sit on the bench yeah. because it's uh it's nonsense to train a lot and then sit on the bench this yeah. was not my goal i always wanted to be like starting five and play and uh, i still have at home i collected it's also gamification <laughs> when when you had a game uh i don't know how it is nowadays but there was like a sheet where they enter how many points you have and ah. so on and i made a deal with my coach i said if i if I score more than 30 points, then the sheet is for me. I take it home with me. <laughs> so I have like a full stack of these sheets. And 30 points is a lot. <laughs> oh, man, that's epic. You know, it's funny because you mentioned like uh, Japan and basketball. I don't play basketball, never play. I was always the, the shortest kid in my in my, in my my class. In Japan, they love basketball. But exactly. In Japan, we did go. You remember pretty much when we were basketball before, before we imp yeah, in Shinjuku, exactly, before we infiltrated the the modified car scene in uh, Daikoku. That was so cool. We played on the roof, on some rooftop thingy. Nice. And you know, it's fu you've been to Japan before? You not yet, not yet. Because I know you wanted to go, you're, you're planning to go from the south tip yeah. to the north tip of Japan if by I, bicycle. Yeah, just yeah. just to, by bicycle. That's your plan. Yeah, yeah it would take around three weeks, I think. Tell me about it. How the hell did you get that idea? Spontaneous. <laughs> 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 well, I was um, always fascinated by Japan. Yeah. Because, uh, well, first of all, um, my grandparents, well, one grand my one grandma, they grew up on the Kuril Islands. This is mm. island group which where you, you can see Japan. It's Russia, but yeah. you can see Japan. Very east from, of Russia. I was there, yes. I yeah. was there, and uh, I also saw Japan. I even got an SMS, uh, welcome to Japan. Oh, I Japan. I'm pulling it up on the map right now. As we yeah, speak. Kuril Islands. Yeah. And, um, well, the closest island, Kuril Islands is a long stretch of thou more than 1,000 kilometers, but the closest yeah. island, if I'm not mistaken, is Shikatan, or, yeah, probably it's Shikatan. Yeah. Anyways, um so all my, uh, and my mother, my father, they both were in Japan many times. So I'm the only family uh, member that never was in Japan. Mm. And uh, I'm always fascinated with Japanese cuisine, yes. uh, Japanese movies. Yes. Uh, I really love Japanese culture, especially because they're so disciplined. They are like, um, they, they are ready to basically sacrifice all their life to make the perfect, whatever, rice. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. they are ready to sacrifice all their life to master a thing. And I respect that a lot because I'm more or less the same. Yeah. I try to master the things. And um, that's why I want to, pro probably this is how the idea came. Uh, I wanted to experience 
not only the standard touristic stuff, but I want to experience full of Japan. So I said, okay, why not to combine it with a nice... I, I'm an explorer, with I'm an adventurer. <laughs> so yeah, with some exercise, with some adventure. So I yeah. just take a bike. And I also thought like this. First of all, I asked uh, a couple of clients of mine who are in, they are bike experts. Mm. And I said, okay, what bike you recommend? And they gave me like full list. And I said, you know what? This is too easy. I just go to Japan. I drive down to the south with a train or whatever. I go to a local bike shop, <laughs> give me whatever you have, and then I drive on. This is how I'm going to do it. I planned I it for it, this year, but uh, this year I it was a lot of work. I cannot just say, okay, uh, I will not work. I go to Japan, drive a bike. But uh, maybe if I manage next year, but I will do it. Yeah, I will do it. Uh, and the plan is also, I will not do hardcore, meaning I will not sleep outside, but I will go, let's say, from hotel to hotel. Yeah. And the only thing I will have with me is uh, maybe a backpack with my MacBook. Yeah. And uh, that's it. That's what I'm going to do. I'm, and I'm not going to do like a record setting. I'm, yeah. I am I want to do it as fast as possible. No, I'm going to enjoy it. I will Hell yeah. just drive on, look at the landscapes, enjoy Japan, go from city to city, enjoy the hotels, enjoy the people and that's it i will not make uh, uh try to break any records there yeah. or whatever no i wouldn't do it either japan's just, just enjoy so nice. enjoy yeah. It. yeah i mean hey when you do it you want to come with me with the bike I'm not <laughs> like a, i was not gonna say that i was gonna say i'll be in a city and when you, you can drive with a car <laughs> <laughs> i'll join you with this um but when you do it um maybe maybe we'll be in tokyo or something and then we'll meet for steak or something hey. how cool would that be you know <laughs> why not and then we can show the Exert on this video. Yes, and then we're like, "Oh, look!" At the exactly, <laughs> that's what we're gonna do. And you know, the crazy thing is, uh, I had this funny idea of like building a quote-unquote secret life in Japan, where I would basically I buy a, uh, a Nissan Skyline just like out of the box, buy it there. Cause how much is Nissan Skyline or Nissan GTR? Something sixty k, eighty k, something like that. I'll buy it. Then I go to like one car modifier, like a good one, and I'm like, "Whatever, here's three hundred k." see you in six months go nuts you know uh, maybe give him some like i like the color green or whatever right <laughs> and then just come back and then i have this mod nissan skyline needs to be blue okay for example no first i i would take it like poison green you know like full-on like a lambo green with like under lights like on, on the bottom like need for like speed that. underground yeah exactly exactly <laughs> and then i would just come back and i would be like hey you know i'm back check out my car and then i would have this car and then i would you know have my normal life in europe and then Every year, just for one month, just go to Japan. I would rent a a big a garage in Yokohama, like in the industry area, and that's where I have my Nissan stored, or whatever. Maybe maybe I'll buy a Mitsubishi. I don't know yet, right? And then I go there every month, every year. I, I fly first class. I eat steak in the airplane, and then I go there and I, you know, I unveil my Nissan, and then I just drive around for a month and hang out with all the cool car modifiers. And then just go back to Europe again. Yeah, let me know. I come by with a bike. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, it's crazy. Like all the people. So, so we wanted to experience this when we went to Japan. And it was really funny because we, I wanted to go to Japan because I wanted to be there anyways. And then as we were there, we talked about Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift, the movie. Mm. And we would both like, man, how cool would it be if we would find out about the, the car scene there, da, da, da. And then, I mean, we made a whole episode about this on the podcast too. And then Primoz... I was hustling at home. I had a lot of stuff to do. And pretty much he's like, I'm going to try to find the location now because on the internet we found some stuff on where these meetings are. Because they're all like underground, right? Mm -hmm. They're not official. Are and, they illegal? Um, Partly yes, partly no. Some of the cars are not 100% street worthy. Mm. Then some of the times they drift and stuff like that. But if you compare it to the U.S. car scene where, you know, they're literally doing donuts and then people get hit by the cars and stuff like that, mm. it's very, hum it's very, very, you know, humane. It's very professional. Like, they, they're Japanese. Japan style. Yeah, exactly. So, pretty much ventures out to try to find the pin on the Google Maps. And then he realizes that's on the highway. Like, I can't get there unless I'm in a car myself. So, he finds this random guy. He, you're, you're walking around and then there was a, a modified car and he, and he waves him down and he like Google translates hey man can you show me where this part is yeah. and he takes me to then the other place the bigger one yeah and then he, he's like yo get in the car I'm going to the meeting so he ma meets this random Japanese guy he has to like translate Google with mm. this guy and he brings him to this modified car meeting and then he finds out like yo we're meeting every Friday here every Sunday here every Saturday here and then we basically like infiltrated like we we rent a, a mclaren 
my client is Japanese because as a, as a foreigner, you need a foreign driving license, Mm-mm. which I didn't have. So we hang out with my client. We rent a McLaren for him. We drive around in the McLaren, go to these car meetings, which is cool because the McLaren is a quote unquote supercar. But those guys, they're not really into supercars. They're into modified cars. Right? Master their craft. Exactly. Yeah. Mastering their craft and stuff like that. And it's really freaking amazing. Like the... The car scene there is like everybody is friends. Everybody's hyped about the other guy. And I feel like in America, it's all like, who is the coolest? I'm the coolest. I'm cooler than you. But in, in Japan, it's more like, oh, my God, you're so cool. I'm so happy for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Absolutely. it's just like brotherhood. And and that's really cool. And, and that, that really fascinated me. So I thought like, hey, I should buy, I should buy a Japanese car and just get it modified. I don't want to modify it myself because I know nothing about it. And... What I have is like when I'm into something, I want to be the best at it, which is both good, but it's also really bad because if I want to be the best at it, I, I invest a lot of time into it. So I know if I would get into modifying cars, then like my life would take a turn and I would just go all out nuts with modifying cars and then I would you know let other areas of my life slack because I would just become so obsessed with it. So I got to protect myself from like, oh, I know I would get so hardcore into this. I'm just going to let someone else do it for me. Kind of like this. Well, you need to find the balance. Exactly. If you find a new hobby that's uh, giving you, let's say, a new perspective <coughs> on everything that you do, whether mm-hmm. it's picking up a musical instrument, uh, car modifying, uh, painting, it will give you a new perspective, give you new skills. Um, at the same time, it cannot uh, take too much time and too much too much uh, let's say a big part of your thinking processes uh, so you can still stick to what you're doing but at the same time it's like with a gym you need to to find a balance Uh, you're in business you go to the gym to release some stress Um, the same is when uh, you find a hobby you increase your skill you increase your skill set and at the same time you do not um, let's say uh, allow that your business is going uh, down or anything or your exactly. relationships yeah. so you need always need to find a balance and the japanese uh, you know that's their philosophy to find a balance <laughs> yeah, uh, yin and yang and uh, at the same time they're mastering their craft but uh, they are not allowing at least what i have heard they are not allowing uh, their life to let's say to occupy like mm-hmm. big space of mm-hmm. their life i mean it's interesting too because y- Let's talk more about your crazy expeditions that you're on because this whole Japan with the bicycle thing, you've done way crazier stuff, I would almost argue. And because you said like you cannot let it allow the to, to slack off in the business, you're literally tra- – aren't you traveling with like a mobile satellite internet box thingy? Yeah. And uh, I remember I think it was the first or second week where I joined your program and um and you're like oh yeah by the way like let me know uh because at that time i'll be on the mount everest base camp or something like that yeah <laughs> and you're like literally like i'm like this guy is working from mount everest base camp yeah so but you you didn't go all the way up you were just there for fun or what, what was the deal well um i had some friends that went up mount everest that year <laughs> And I thought, okay, it will be nice if I go there to the base camp and visit them and yeah. give them some support, you know, be Damn. there and tell them, hey, you can do it. I also took my father there, so we went mm. together. But the internet at Everest base camp was pretty solid. I did not need any device there. So there's <laughs> Wi-Fi. Okay. Um, I also went a little bit further, but I did not go up fully yet. Um, at some point, I will try to do it, I think. Um, because I also want to do a project that's called Seven Summits and Seven Volcanoes, mm, which is uh, climb every highest mountain of every continent and climb every highest volcano of every continent. So <laughs> next month, even less, in 20 days, I will go and try to climb uh, Orizaba, which is highest volcano of North America, and uh, it is the highest mountain of Mexico. So I will try to do it. It is not an easy mountain. But I'm prepared. I prepare myself every day for it. I go to the gym nowadays, uh, sometimes even two times per day in the morning and no the evening. Um, because, uh, well, this is hard. Mountaineering is hard. Mm. But this is the project that I'm doing. And, uh, you know, why I'm doing it is because, and also this J- Japan trip, or I was in Antarctica, this was hardcore, Mount Everest, and... 
Like I do lots of crazy stuff. Um, I've been to crazy places, for example, the Kuril Islands. Uh, it was a crazy expedition because I also need to find balance like this because I'm sitting in front of the computer analyzing blood work 50 mm. times per day, 16 hours per day. Mm. Uh, in front of the computer, I don't get any emotions. Mm. For example, I get emotions when we... Uh, 10 extra testosterone <laughs> we get a nice result i get emotions but during the process let's say you send me blood work well i cannot have emotions i need to be accurate mm -hmm. uh, i don't get positive or negative feelings i don't feel stressed i don't feel bored i don't feel excited i just do my job mm. i look at it like a calculator i have no emotions while doing it i just do my job as accurate as as it's possible That's why I need to balance it out. That's why I need to make crazy expeditions. I need to drive crazy cars. I need to meet crazy people. I need to have crazy talks. I need to feel emotions. I need to compensate this boring 16 hours in front of my computer. I mean, boring is not does not mean that I don't like it. I love my job and I love what I'm doing. I'm helping lots of people. But I need to come to work cold-hearted. Yeah. When someone comes with a very critical medical condition or problem in his blood work or he really wants to lose weight build muscle and so on i cannot have bad mood or good mood mm -hmm. i cannot rely on emotions or my let's say m state of let's say my mood feelings and so on i need to sit down capsule myself from the outside world yeah. and just do my job as accurate as possible yeah. and after this because this is so emotionless i cannot live on emotionless i need to do crazy stuff yeah. so i fill my life with emotions i think that's a natural thing to do and i like it mm. so i need i also need to experience things that's why i love to travel i love to go to expensive restaurants great hotels dangerous countries dangerous mountains dangerous expeditions because down the line what else you can do yeah what else yeah. you want to look back uh, when you're 80 or 120 you want to look back and say okay i done I, i've done crazy stuff i have done inspiring stuff and i'm not doing this for anyone i'm doing this for myself mm. for balance and because so i don't regret anything so i say okay i traveled all countries i climbed all mountains mm -hmm. and so on and so on and i like it i enjoy it i'm not doing this to show 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 off for example yeah yeah i mean i literally had to tickle it out of you just now like talk about all these things because earlier you're like oh yeah because we were talking about heading for dinner while i'm still here and you're like, oh no then i'll be in mexico you didn't tell me oh i'm in mexico so i'm climbing up some freaking volcano <laughs> so i could tell that you're not bragging with this um what's the what's the most dangerous thing have you ever been in a dangerous situation where you said okay this is legitimate this could go the wrong way at any point mm, i have to think well I trained undercover with the special forces. Mm. I cannot say of what country. <laughs> I was about to ask. All right, all right, all right. Uh, but I trained with like super elite special forces, which was pretty dangerous. How did you get in there? I am assuming you had a client and then you were like, Can uh, I train? Not a client. This was a friend of mine. Okay. Um, he had the connections. I had to pay money there, but I legit trained for close. Uh, it was five days with special Damn. forces. Damn. Like uh, full on. This was a, ex a crazy experience and like with several teams, meaning with a sniper team, mm. with a tank. Uh, I, I was shooting with tanks and so <laughs> on. So this was pretty crazy. But I mean, everything was control, under control. Yeah. But for me, it was like super crazy yeah, at yeah. that yeah. point. Um, it felt very dangerous because <laughs> it was sharp ammunition. Yeah. And, um, and Antarctica was uh, pretty dangerous. I mean... Uh, it was dangerous in that sense that it was, was I set the world record there. It oh, really? was the I was the first person whose first mountain was Mount Winson, which is <laughs> uh, the highest mountain of uh, Antarctica. Yeah. How I got there was I had a good friend, which I also met at the expedition on the Kuril Islands. Mm. I got to know him there and he said, oh, you're a crazy guy. If I have a crazy expedition coming up, I will let you know. <laughs> and then like two months later, we got really close friends. And he said, oh, I'm planning to go to Antarctica. You want to come with me? <laughs> and I said, I've never been to the mountains. Um, is it dangerous? He said, oh, no, not that much. <laughs> Just to put into perspective, this guy is a jet fighter pilot. <laughs> he went to space. 
uh, he also climbed dangerous mountains. He said, no, it's not that dangerous. <laughs> so mm, I should have thought a little bit uh, uh, <laughs> the more. The context matters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I said, well, okay, I will go. And he needed to um, talk to the president of the Mountain Federation that they <laughs> let me because they did not want to let me into this expedition because that is literally too dangerous for me. Mm. But then he said, oh, no, this guy is fit. Uh, he's athletic. He has endurance, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's no problem. I will take care of it. I will take responsibility. And they said, really? They said, okay, we will take him. So my first mountain was in Antarctica, the highest <laughs> mountain. The temperature was close to minus 70, not it's 17, 70, 70. Celsius? Celsius. Damn. Uh, there was a team member, a girl, she froze her fingers so the fingers were black because she had a small hole oh, in her um glove in her glove and the gloves are like pillows yeah yeah uh, you need to buy the craziest the warmest equipment that exists on earth you cannot buy mediocre equipment like gloves like this cost like 500 dollars and you need inside already gloves that are like 300 dollars then you have second glove third glove and so on Damn. so it's crazy stuff i went there well, the problem was the oxygen, even though it is not a high mountain. Um, the further you go away from uh, uh, from the um, equator, mm. the harder it is with oxygen. So in, so in Antarctica, it's very close to the South Pole. It's very far from the equator. 5,000 meters, they feel like 7,000 meters mm. in the mm. Himalaya, for mm. example. And for me, it was first time in the mountains, let's say 7,000-ish in the Himalaya, for example, I got black eyes from hypoxia. I was feeling very bad, my, very bad. My head was exploding. I could not sleep. I could not eat. Um, it was very, very bad. But I had a great team around me. They gave me tea. They forced me to eat. They forced me to drink. They care about me. They pushed me on. And I made it. But it was very hard. This was... I mean, it was... It was crazy. Damn. But... Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's it's hard to say because in the situation with the adrenaline, you don't feel it. But mm. afterwards, you think this was very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Actually, mm -hmm. you you don't feel it when you're there because you're just surviving. You're just trying to sleep. Your head is like exploding from the hypoxia yeah. up in the mountains, yeah. and you need to carry your backpack. Like backpack is 50k, mm. uh, 50 kilo. Mm -hmm. uh, from base camp to camp one you need to have a sled which is like 80 to 100 kilo with your backpack mm. so you need to, all your tents and all your food you need to bring with you you yeah. have no sherpa you have no uh, no guys that uh, drag everything for you mm. like for example on mount everest or yeah. kilimanjaro or whatever no you need to do everything yourself so it was a pretty hard mountain especially as your first one <laughs> <laughs> so but when they told me, uh, when uh, we requested at the federation that they let me, that they give, because you need a license for it. Oh, yeah. They need yeah. to agree because, I mean, it's life and death. I was standing, for example, on the ridge, close to the summit. I was standing on the ridge. You could not stand with parallel feet. You need to stand Ooh. like this with your 8,000 boots. And to the left, it goes like more than a kilometer. It goes down like this. Damn. And I'm standing there. And I never clipped off and clipped on the, uh, how you call it, the car this carabine. Yeah, carabine. Never. Yeah. <laughs> and with these gloves like this, I'm like, guys, what should I do? And I'm not safe here. It goes like a kilometer <laughs> down and I'm standing like this. So this was actually very dangerous. Yeah. And our super guide, he said, this was a very dangerous situation. Because if you don't clip it in and then uh, you start, that's it. That's it. What is the view up there? Is it just Amazing. white in all directions? I mean, you no. You have rocks, and the rocks are like. I mean, when I went to Antarctica, I thought uh, it will be like uh, standard rocks, ice, and snow. Yeah. But actually, it looked like Mars. Damn. Really, like the stones had a very unique structure. The ice, even the sun, it circles. Like for two weeks, I we did not have night. Damn, was true, of course, yeah, all the time. Like, yeah, yeah. So it's like very weird, like all the structures, like how it looks like there are no trees, no plants, no animals, nothing. <laughs> so it looks very weird, very weird. I like mean, Mars, yeah. like a different planet, literally. Yeah, no other life other than just rocks and, yeah. and, and cold and, and snow. It's, it's cool that what you said earlier, this whole idea of like when you work, it's just turn off the emotions and you got to function, mm -hmm. right? And as an entrepreneur, I know many listeners of this podcast 
are advanced entrepreneurs, but there's also a lot of beginners that might not be able to resonate with it just as much. But like I see this with every single client of mine. It's like you have to slip into this mode of functioning because most people, they never really learn how to master their own emotions because also you've talked about mastery. A lot of people, because when you go to your job, it doesn't matter. Like when you have a nine to five job, most of the jobs, they have zero consequences if you're emotional there, right? Unless you're maybe uh, a jet pilot, like you said, or an astronaut where you have to learn how to do that. So then you get into entrepreneurship and you have to realize like, okay, um, I have a bad month right now. I need to stay relaxed because mm. I need to do the right things. Uh, I have a good month right now, which is great. You know, I have permission to feel good. But a lot of times it's just grinding. And uh, my very first mentor, Owen Cook, he talked a lot about this um, high achiever mindset that a lot of high achievers, they have to be so in control during their normal life that just like you said, during their off time, they're seeking the thrills. Mm. They want to go on these adventures. You know, Richard Branson, for example, mm. great example. You know, he he had all these kind of crazy adventures on the hot air balloon and stuff like that. I mean, Virgin Galactic, where he went to space. He was one of the first people that went to space, just a rich dude going up the space. And I noticed that myself as well, that I'm like, the goals, the, the things I want to do in my spare time are on one hand, just really simple of like, I just want to have, dinner with my family and relax and play mm. maybe some video games but then also I have these other things where I'm like yo let's fly to XYZ let's go heli skiing because not only do I need it I feel that the, the, I feel that I feel drawn to these kind of things because of exactly what you said it's the one time where I don't just need to function and just be stoic about things but this is where I can like fully experience life but then on the other hand and this is kind of the coolest thing about entrepreneurship is like you get to be a kid with money. You know, like um, one of the funniest things, also because you mentioned Counter-Strike, one of the funniest things I've done last year was I realized LAN parties still exist. <laughs> like, did you know that? I had, I, I always I mean, now esports has got huge. Exactly. It's a huge industry. But I, I had, uh, have clients who are very, like, they're professional players and several like uh, CSGO and some Hell other yeah. stuff. So they're like huge events, like full arenas. But they I make. didn't even know that because I thought like well on like uh, online has taken over so why is there still a need for land parties but then I figured out no land parties are still very much alive and there was a land party in Austria it was like the biggest land party in Austria it was like 400 people or 600 or something like that so I I remember going there as a kid completely broke like I had to I was like 15 and whenever I would go to these big 400 600 people land parties I had to like ask my parents like can you bring me there you know can you pick me up and now like last year, I'm like, yo, I want to go to a LAN party. So we drove from Prague with a first class train all the way down the Graz. Uh, we ate like p pancakes on the f on the train and stuff like that. And then we just showed up to the to the LAN party. And it's like, this is just as awesome when I was a kid, but it's even more awesome that I have money now. And we would go get steak and stuff like that. And I would sleep in an Airbnb instead of having to sleep on the floor in mm -hmm. the hall. So this is really cool. Like, um, and I notice this with a lot of entrepreneurs, they have to be super crazy functioning managers and they have to be on top of their game. But in their spare time, they're just like teenagers, but with money. You True. know, they want to have fun. They want to get every squeeze, every little drop out of life and they want to enjoy it because they know most of the time I'm just grinding. I'm building an empire. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to people. I'm providing the best possible service or coaching to my clients. I have to be the top of the top of the top of my game because otherwise I'm going to get eaten up by the competitors. I'm going to get eaten up by life in general or just by myself. So I see this so much with the harder the worker, the harder they party, the harder they try to enjoy life as much as possible. So for me personally, whenever I take someone with me on traveling, be it my mom or my girlfriend or my parents or my dad, I could see them enjoy it for sure. No doubt about mm -hmm. that. But I enjoy it even more because I know the work that I had to put into that because I feel every single feeling of pain of sorrow of anxiety that i had to endure to get to this and i've had many many experiences in my life where i was just crying for joy where where i just felt all the stuff i had to go through to get to this point and a lot of people that are not in in entrepreneurship 
they just want things given to them. They say, you know, I, I want to win the lottery, uh, or so and so should give me money. The state should give me money. Like, you know, I mean, with with, with this whole COVID bullshit, we've seen way more of that. That people say, like, hey, I want to have more money by the state. I don't even want anything given to me because I know how sweet things taste mm -hmm. when you deserve them through blood, through sweat, through tears. And and I remember specifically scenes like first time in Hawaii. When I was at the green beach, there's a green beach in Hawaii. It's like a beach that is like through sulfuric acid turned green or mm -hmm. something like that. And it's uh, at the very south tip of uh, Big Island, Hawaii, which is also Volcano Island. Yeah, Hawaii is volcanic. It's, it's gorgeous. And I was there and I'm like, look where all the pain I've had to go through brought me. And back then I wasn't even rich. I was literally just an unpaid assistant who just started getting paid. And I'm like... The sleepless nights, the jet legs. I, I I was so broke I couldn't even afford shoes that had no holes in them. My shoes had holes in them very quickly. And then I just walked around with shoes with holes at the bottom at their soles for like a year. My feet were always wet, you know? <laughs> you walk on a on, on a wet street, boom, now your feet are gonna be wet for the next week. And and I, I was there at that beach for the first time and I'm like, look where all this pain, all this sweat, all this all this hard work has brought you. And I have, ever since then, I have these feelings all the time. When I'm in Japan, when I'm sitting in first class for the first time, when I'm in Dubai, when I'm when we were hiking up the Dolomites, I'm just like, I built this. Nobody gave this to me. Nobody gave this to me. I didn't win this. I earned this. Mm -hmm. And that is the best feeling ever. And I actually think that's addictive. It makes you addicted to it. And... That's probably also a reason why you like to go on all these adventures because you can. Yes, true. But um, I know I have some friends that are very rich, some clients that became friends, like real life friends. And here we are talking about, for example, I have a client. He is a dollar billionaire. Nice. Not millionaire, multi-million billionaire. I mean, he had to work all his life, so many hours, discipline, master's craft, built an empire, built everything surround, surround, like surrounding him. All is very complex what he built, and he does not have that much free time, and he is not young anymore. Mm. He has a family, so imagine how he cherishes the free time that he has, mm. because people with such amount of money the money may even get it pressures you mm -hmm. um in this case i mean in in my experience guys with such amounts of money they want to squeeze everything out of life at this point because they understand that money you can get more at all time if you want but time you cannot buy mm. that's why they try to when they visit, uh, for example, this guy, he has a personal assistant who, he has many personal assistants, mm. first of all, but one assistant is responsible for traveling and traveling only. Mm -hmm. So she basically finds the best hotels, the best restaurants, best transfer and so on and so on. So he does not uh, waste any time yeah. waiting for a taxi uh, and not waste quality lifetime by flying option number two helicopter but she makes sure that he gets the best helicopter the best hotel the best restaurant so he can enjoy life to the maximum nice because he understands that i mean the time is finite yeah. is, at some point it will be over mm. so you need to squeeze everything out of it and if you have that much money you can do it and you earned it mm. it's not like it fell on his head but he had to work all his life for it and he's in the position to make the best possible out of it now, which is also responsibility because if you have uh, $2,000 million, I mean, you can still uh, be on the couch. But from my experience, and I know some people that are like not only rich couple of million, uh, but they're like in the stratosphere, like one billionaire, several like super rich multi-millionaires and they're all they have it's the same pattern and they're all from different countries i know them mm -hmm. and they are good friends of mine some of them very good friends and um i mean it is the similar pattern that they're all the same in this regard that they will not settle for less mm. they only settle for the best mm -hmm. why also maybe a reason because 
they try to give the best for others yeah. in their company for their clients so why should they settle for less as a consumer Hell why yeah. should they go to hotel number two if they can go to number one for example and at the same time like i said with the adventures they all understand you need to squeeze out all the emotions because at some point you will lay in the bed you're about to die and then you will say oh fuck it um uh, I want, always wanted to go to Japan. I had 50 million in my pocket, mm. but it is, was just a plane ticket away, you know? It was just three days, but I was stressed about something at work, uh, yeah. blah, blah, blah. So there is this pattern that these people, they do not settle for less than the best in business, but also out of business in their real life. When they go to a restaurant, uh, they want the best school for their kids. Yeah. They want the best teachers. They want the best quality shoes without holes for their kids, <laughs> for themselves, and so on. They're not ready to settle for less than the best. Mm. Most likely because they are trying to give their best as well, investing so much time. Yep. So I see this pattern with uh, with these super rich people that I know. And I learned a lot from them. Life's philosophy. How they approach life and they also like this that at f even just today in the morning um i have a very good friend he is uh, well I, I don't need to say who he is but we talk talk about uh, he's very like here in cyprus he's like top of the top mm -hmm. and um he said you know what back in the day when i started to earn a lot of money i used I used to stress about like some small stuff because perfectionist and if the engineer make mistakes, I stressed about it. But now I realize if I stress about it, first of all, I cannot find a proper solution maybe because I'm stressed, because maybe I'm panicking. Yeah. By second, it will rob my lifetime and my life quality. Hell Why yeah. should I stress about it? I just pay an expert and he will <laughs> resolve it for me exactly and that. I can just enjoy my life and go on an adventure. Yeah. So they are trying to make life full with emotions, less stress, and just enjoy at this point mm. while delivering maximum uh, amount of quality work. This is the pattern that I see with these people. While, for example, people that are not used to that much money or they're usually the people that are not used to work accurately, work high quality, deliver high quality yep. to clients. Yep. Well, they are not used to this as a giver, so they will not be used to this as a taker. Mm -hmm. Maybe. What do you think, when you look at, at these top of the top guys, I mean, you've worked with top guys in athleticism. You've worked with top guys um, in terms of money-making business companies. When you look at the top 1% of you know guys, or, or girls for that matter, do you think there is something that they've had that they were born with or do you think it's circumstance or do you think it's both what how much are you born with how much is circumstance i mean born with genetic wise the factor is not that high i think i think mm. parents family how you were brought up is a big factor mm. Because I have great parents, I had great mentors and great coaches in sports that, for example, said at when I was 12, hey, you're too weak, go to the gym, I show you how it's done, you need to get stronger. Hey, it was not pro sports at 12, he could have said nothing and mm -hmm. just uh, kept going on with his life, but he really cared about me. Mm -hmm. I, I was always um, blessed with great, even teachers at school, even at school, simple school. I had excellent teachers. Not all, but most of them were really excellent teachers. Yeah. History, German language, English. I really, I was blessed with great teachers even in school. So I think parents, teachers, mentors is very important because they can show you the path, how it's done. And also here, we talked about Counter-Strike. I was 14, I was playing with 19-year-olds mm. in basketball. I was 15, I was playing with 25-year-olds. Yeah. Um, my best friends, like let's say my top 10 friends that I have in real life, eight of them are 45 plus. Mm. Mm. So I always um, learn from people who are wiser, smarter, more experienced than me. And uh, I think this is a blessing. In my opinion, this is a blessing. So genetic factor, there is one for sure. But in my opinion, how you were brought up uh, is much, much more important. Also, let's say genetics, 
Well, there is a percentage, but it's low. Let's say one digit, 3% genetics. Yeah. Because, mm. I mean, some people are just not born with the genetics and some people are born with crazy genetics. Like there are, let's say, um, freaking genius, like from the start, because they have a genetic component that their brain uh, has that they are just super crazy smart. They can soak up information. They have it. Uh, it's up to them how they use it. But there's a small percentage, let's say 3%. Mm. Let's say the other uh, 97, you can split up into 50% out of it, parenting, uh, uh, mentors, coaches, uh, how you were brought up and so on. And the other half is of obviously how you react to it, how you use with it. Same example, you can be super blessed genetically, you have a super crazy brain. But at the same time, you're not using it because you yeah. have no willpower. Yeah. It is not steered into the right direction. That's why, in my opinion, I mean, uh, it sounds like I'm bragging, blah, blah, blah. But down the line, the Ferrari is standing there. <laughs> <laughs> down the line, the Ferrari is staring there. And I'm doing Antarctica expedition that costs six digits mm. as my first mountain. Mm. So, um, first of all, like I said, I had great mentors, teachers, parents. My parents come from a scientific background, so they are all like have high academic levels. My grandpas, both, are one of them is a very famous person in physics. One of the other is a, a famous engineer. So was, people always say, "Oh, you're so smart, Nikki Rob." But no, I'm not that smart. Like my family, for sure, mm. they're way smarter than me. Mm. Maybe I'm smarter in my niche, but overall, when I'm talking to my grandpa. The guy who's in physics, he knows everything. Not <laughs> only physics, <laughs> art, history, everything. How old is he? He's now in his 80s. Yeah, all right. 81, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, and he's still teaching physics, by the way. <laughs> no so, way. they are crazy smart. Like, me, nothing. They are everything. And the other half is, I have crazy willpower. When I set a goal, I want to do it. Uh, I have a drive, I want to achieve my goals, and I'm ready to work. Um, if I need to work uh, 16 hours, I will do 16 hours. If I have to do three all-nighters in a row, I will do it. If I have to go up this mountain in Antarctica, it was 24 hours up and down without rest, non-stop, I, I do it. Mm. I'm not making any excuses there because I know down the line I will regret if I not go up there and down the line I will not I will regret if I am not working accurately. Yeah. So the other half is like your mental state, what bios is installed into your heart basically. <laughs> yeah. How serious are you about your goals in my opinion? But at the same time it comes from somewhere, maybe from good teaching, maybe from good parents. It, ha it has to stem from somewhere. For example, my biggest idol in my childhood was Michael Jordan. I watched Space Jam when I was whatever, <laughs> four or five, and that's it. I fell in love with Lola Bunny. Epic. Yeah, and then uh, Michael Jordan was my favorite. And I I always watched Michael. I went to the bazaar, I remember, and you could like buy ripped video cassettes or CDs for one euro, and I bought everything that has Michael Jordan. Michael love Jordan it. games, Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan. I was annoying all my family. <laughs> Give me Michael Jordan <laughs> basketball cards. Mike, I want Michael Jordan posters all over my room. I watch every Michael Jordan game. And when I saw Michael Jordan, I always saw in his eyes, he's always pushing. Yeah. Even when he's 30 points up, he's pushing to yeah. the end. He's non-stop pushing, pushing. Maybe it stems from this. I think it's a combination of all. Mm. Genetics, how you're brought up, mm. your perception of the world, who are your idols. Mm. Everything is a component of this, I think. Yeah. I ask everybody the same. And it's always it's always super interesting to to hear what their thoughts are. Like, where does it come from? Where does the discipline come from? And for me, it was very similar. I was always, I can't pinpoint it either. I always wanted more out of life. I always wanted to be the best. Not at everything, but at the thing that I was really into, I wanted to be the freaking best. I wanted to be the best guitarist. I wanted to be the best at Counter-Strike. I wanted to have the highest score there. I just always wanted to win. I also don't know why. It was just there. It was always freaking there. And you know what's funny? Because my, my parents, I come from a super loving household. Love my parents to death don't have any trauma 
You know, the only trauma I have is like stuff where I fell off the roof or something like that. You know, what I mean? or a, mm. a dog bit me. But I don't have any crazy trauma from my parents. Very, very loving household. Very safe. Very secure. Mm. Even, even when I when I started um, as an unpaid assistant for my first um, for my first mentor, I was always like. If push comes to shove, if worse things worse, I could always just come back home. Mm-hmm. My parents will be there for mm-hmm. me, right? So that that gave me a lot of safety, a lot of security. On the other hand, though, what I'm always kind of holding against, specifically my mom, was that she was too nice. And I remember specifically, she always said, "Oh, we'll love you no matter what," right? Um, or just 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 be yourself. You know, if the other kids at school don't like you, it's their fault, right? And I, I I almost got mad now thinking back at that because I'm like, my mom has taught me so much that it's so important to be myself. And if I'm myself, I'll, I'll be loved. That because of that, in school, I was the weird kid. Because while everybody else tried to fit in at least to a degree and they became popular and they had a lot of friends and therefore they had a really cool teenage upbringing, for me it was like, but I'm myself, like, like mom always told me. Why am I not popular, right? All the other kids, they would listen to hip hop and they would just, you know, whatever, go skiing. But I would be like the guy who likes the Simpsons, likes to play video games and listen to metal. So uh, so a lot of kids were like, yo, this guy is a weirdo. Let's not invite him to a party. And that mm. created a lot of suffering within me. So I would almost say I would. I wish my parents would have been harder on me and pushed me more. Because I would have learned how to live up to my potential much earlier. For me, because you said, like, you've always been into sports. You've had great coaches. That didn't start for me until I was 22-ish. When I was 22 years old, I didn't. I, I came out of the army. I liked sports, and I was really good at playing guitar. But that drive came from within me. And only then I started getting a mentor for the first time that I would really look up to. And that was Owen Cook. And, you know, I, I was $16,000 in debt flying to Miami just to be able to work for him for free and sleep on the floor mm-hmm. in his apartment. And um, and I and I think the reason why I did that, why I was willing to go so far, is because I never had a mentor before. Because my whole childhood was, hey, if you don't want to go, don't do it. Like, I would, I remember I would have a skiing, ski course, skiing lessons. And I was signed up. I was, it was just ready to go. I had my shoes on. I'm like, Mom, I don't want to go. And she's like, well, if you don't want to go, that's fine. We'll just stay here. I wish she had pushed me. Mm. I wish she had been like, shut up and go do it. Even though you don't feel like it right now, it's going to be good that you do it. So I had to develop this discipline myself. But it was many years until I even went that far to develop the discipline. And I wish I had that before. So ultimately, the question I wanted to ask you is, what constitutes, because you said like a lot of it is a good upbringing. What constitutes good upbringing in your in your head? I think there is no standard because you need to find the key for the door. My mm. parents were very strict, mm. very strict. So it's like uh, I brought an A minus, and the first question was, well, "What what about the minus? It should not be there." <laughs> so it was uh, strict. It was a very it is a very loving household, a very good relationship with my parents, but in terms of being successful and bringing results it was very strict so during that time it was obviously very annoying for a kid that's let's say 12 14 16 18 years old you're constantly under pressure but now time passed now i'm I'm older i can say that it was ideal Mm. because it gave me it was uh, like um it was a great turbo boost yeah. for success because yeah. I was like primed. I was like, um, this was my standard because of my parents. And uh, for example, talking about mentorship and so on, because I made great experience, I had a great experience with uh, parenting. Um, I had the best grades. I was super crazy good at university. I also had great professors there. And um but my basketball coaches were the most important for me mm. because they were always there for me. I had great basketball coaches. And um, I learned that coaches are very important. For example, 
if I want to do something now, for example, I want to learn how to play the guitar, the first thing I'm doing is here in Cyprus, I will try to find the best possible teacher for it. Mm. Uh, for example, I play the piano and um, I found the best teacher in my region and I trained with her for several years mm. because I understood how important that is for success, reaching your goal, saving time mm, yeah. because at the same time I can just study uh, at home but uh, there will not be a teacher that will steer me into the right direction, mm. give me critical advice. Mm. So for example, I studied myself for several years and then for ex first I started with a teacher. Yeah. Uh, there's a crazy story behind it. Go for it. Uh, my parents, they bluffed. They said, okay, <laughs> uh, uh, they said, if you buy a piano, will you start uh, studying piano? And I thought they will never buy me a piano. <laughs> this is too expensive. I said, okay, I will. And then like in two weeks, piano was standing there. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I'm like, fuck. They bluffed. <laughs> but, <laughs> so I started to study with a teacher, with the yeah. same teacher, yeah. a Russian a woman um, who finished like a very famous school. And um, at first I did not like it because mm. it was not initiated by me directly. Mm. And I did not like that much the pieces that I was playing there. Then I stopped, but I kept on studying myself without the teacher. And then in two years I was these two years without the teacher i was studying the pieces that i really wanted to play on the piano and i was studying every day minimum one hour mm. um it was a habit before going to sleep i drove my my parents were i was driving them crazy <laughs> because they also did not expect that i was like <laughs> uh, uh studying that much for example if you want to study a piece some part of the piece you have to go and repeat yeah this can go for half an hour you go crazy yeah, yeah. but you need to do it you need to press it into your fingers yeah. my parents were going crazy can you not study that much <laughs> no i need to study you gave me the piano <laughs> <laughs> so and then i realized that at some point uh i studied very complicated pieces on my own and i realized okay to reach the next step I went to my old teacher and I said, okay, I want to begin again. Mm. And when I played for her, she said, how can you do this on your own? It's impossible. I said, well, every day minimum one hour. I said, <laughs> well, you're, you're amazing. <laughs> and then we multiply my discipline and my hard work with her skill and with the pieces I wanted to play. Yeah. And I make great progress. I played pieces, even that professional pianists play. Yeah, yeah. And I enjoy it. I love it. Yeah. And what uh, the point of the matter is that if I want to achieve something that's hard to achieve, for yeah. example, playing such a complicated piece, a teacher is a time saver. Mm. Yes, of course, we are both online coaches and it sounds like I want to make advertisement, find a teacher, find a coach, but down the line is like this. For everything that I have done successfully, I always had a great teacher. For example, chess. I also love chess. Mm. I always, uh, I made sure I never lose chess in real life. <laughs> Everyone who's to challenge me in chess, I, it's like... 10 years, no one beat me in chess in the last 10 years in real play. life. He loves you chess. You ready? <laughs> 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 For this, I had like three different chess coaches. Yeah. Even. One offline, two online. No, yeah, so online. like, uh, it saves time. It steers you into the right direction. You're going to get a, so you just, you just got an apartment here in, in, in Limassol. Are you going to get a piano there? Or Already keyboard? there. You ready? Already no there. Already there. What Already there. Piano do you have? A Japanese one, kawaii. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. Of course. Uh, that was <laughs> you told me earlier. You don't even have the toilet paper bought yet. Piano is ready. Piano. <laughs> I already bought the piano in uh, what? Uh, what was it? March. Yeah. One of the first things. Uh, and I said, okay, store it for me. When the apartment is ready, the first thing that goes in there is the piano. Nice. I want to. I, al I already practice. Mm. Tomorrow is piano tuning. A guy will come to <laughs> tune the piano, so it's like proper sound. And then I will study again, like one hour per day. Man. Okay, yeah. I will start with 30 minutes, but uh, it into. will be back to business. Yeah. You know, that's it's funny because one of the things that I want to do the moment I have, uh, I'll probably move to uh, Helsinki uh, for like a year or two with my girlfriend because we've never lived in the same place together, mm -hmm. let alone in the same country <laughs> for very long. I mean, when we met, I lived in Helsinki for like six months and uh -huh. then I moved. 
and um, and I'm like, I want to I want to have a music room there. And then especially when I build my own house, I want to have a recording studio there. Music is one of the things that has that has evaded me for so long because I when I started with the business thing, I went all out and I knew if I do music, I will want to go all out with that as well. So I said, I'm going to put it on the back burner. And I'm by far not as good anymore as I used to be on guitar. I used to be um, pre uh, uh, preparing to go to the Vienna Conservatory of Music. And then I got tendonitis on my left arm. Mm. Couldn't play anymore. All doctors told me I can never play anymore, ever. My whole lower... I understand. My whole lower uh, arm muscle, got it vanished. Like, that, like, it was literally just, like, bone here. Mm -hmm. And I had it on the right arm as well. I got it on both freaking arms. So this is, uh, like, proof that it's not only from masturbating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> because it's both sides. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but one of the things that I want to touch on again is when I, when I build a house, I want to have my own garden. I want to have a goat, at least one goat, because I want to have that goat cheese. <laughs> uh, I want to have a garden, you know, with trees, plum trees, cherry trees, all that jazz. I grew up in a, with a beautiful garden, too. And... I also want to have a basement or a big room with a recording studio, with a drum set, with guitars, with uh, uh, keyboards, with everything there. Because it's, it's, I think it's music is one of the most unexplainable things in the world. I think there's two things that science can't fully explain, and that is love and music. You can say, yeah, okay, if someone is in love, you can look at the chemicals in the brain, right? But you cannot explain, you cannot predict. X person will fall in love with Y person. You cannot predict, you cannot control, you cannot force it. And very similar to that is music. You cannot predict, okay, if I play this melody, you're going to like it, right? You can say, okay, if I make a melody, if I write a hit song, a lot of people are going to like it, but you cannot force someone to like something. And, and that's why I think love and music are these two unexplainable concepts in our life. And that's why I also believe playing music a really important part of my life and I could never ever imagine not playing music I hear music like the moment I wake up I have a song in my head sometimes I dream with a song playing in my head this is one of the, the biggest passions I've always had so I definitely want to have a recording studio in my house and then just record stuff just for fun I don't even care about releasing it or people listening I just want to freaking play it nice what I realize uh, also there's a pattern we talk about like, super rich guys and so on. What, what's the pattern there? There's also one thing that you just mentioned. You say you want to have a house with a recording studio. There should be a cherry tree and a gold. So it's not there yet, but you have a clear vision yes. what's going to come. You look forward to it. Yes. And if you have something you look forward to it, you're ready to work. Because if you have nothing to look forward mm. to, you get into a comfort zone easily. Um like the beach for, let's say, you make a couple of millions, the beach and the hotel is already the comfort zone. But if you don't look forward to the cherry tree and the goat, well, uh, you will get into the comfort zone easily. But like this, you have something to look forward to. You look forward to soon the Ferrari is going to come. Soon the yes. Nissan Skyline is waiting in the garage. Yes. Soon I'm going to Japan to ride my bicycle. Soon there go there's going to be a cherry tree there. And uh, I will make sure the landscape in my garden and the leaves and everything is beautiful. So all, all of these people, there's also a pattern that I realize they always look forward to. They also mm. always have projects uh, maybe even outside of business where they still look forward to it so mm. they have like a, it's a driver that keeps them going towards it because otherwise it will be too boring it's also yeah. we talked about this with a super successful guy here in Cyprus you need to have projects to look forward to otherwise you just chill at home and do nothing yeah. and enjoy a boring life but if you have a project that you work on even if it's just a piano piece or a guitar piece or a recording studio or even just planting a cherry tree you have something to look forward to and you will be ready to work for it yeah true he said literally his quote he said if i make 50 more million next year who cares <laughs> like for me it does not make a difference yeah but if i stop working i get old this is the only thing I'm working, not to get old. I will not stress about the small things, mm. but I will try to create something beautiful. Mm. That way I have something to look forward to. At the end of the day, there will be a nice building standing there. Mm. And I have created something. Mm. So at this point, it's 
maybe some of them doing it for money and said, I want to have more than others. But some, uh, most, there's a pattern they do this, keeps them out of the comfort zone, keeps them yeah. young. There's also a pattern, for example, when I went to the school reunions ha. where you see your old teachers. Yeah. The teachers that stop teach are forced to stop teaching because they're getting too old. Mm. When you see them, when they stop teaching, they age super fast. Yeah. Like the Ferrari, super fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, uh, because they have nothing to do. Yeah. Because when they are teachers, active teachers, they wake up, aha, uh -huh, kids are waiting for me. Have they done their homework? Mm. I need to teach them this. I need to prepare exams. This is, there's something to do. They have a project. They quit teaching after, let's say, 40 years. Um, they have nothing to do anymore. They need to find new hobbies yep. or whatever. Yep. Maybe they go on a cruise, but then they're back from the cruise. What am I doing with my life? And oh. they start to age very fast. Mm. And when I, go to, when I went to these reunions, I saw the teachers that stopped teaching. They got very old, mm. the ones that stopped teaching. Mm. So, for example, people ask me sometimes and say, um, how long are you going to do this? And are you planning on quitting? Well, what are your plans? I will never quit. Maybe I will reduce clients. Yeah. I will not work 16 hours per day when I'm 40 or 50 or 60. Yeah. I will work one or two. I will not take that much, but I will never stop working. Now we come back to Japan. That's how they do it. They master their craft not until 60. They master their craft until they die. Until mm. they are 110 mm. years old, they're yeah. still making sushi in their shop. Mm, yeah. And in my opinion, there is a pattern successful people, healthy people that keeps them sane they ha need to have a certain projection like yeah. you said it's just ring a bell uh, i want to have a goat i want to have a cherry tree it's nothing like uh, super expensive or whatever or yeah. super exclusive yeah. but you have a clear vision of a certain project you look forward to it mm. exactly man and it's it's also that it, it's that delaying of gratification that trains your brain to endure hardship, to endure things where you don't see the results yet. And this is kind of what we've talked about earlier with video games. It's like when you boot up a video game from freaking PlayStation 1 times, right, from the 90s or early 2000s, like you just eat shit until you, f you figure out how to not die on the video game, right? And it takes, like, like, like what was it, your friend or your cousin, where it takes them two weeks to freaking create that, uh, to, to, to clear that level. And then you play a video game now, it's like you log in, and it's like achievement unlocked yeah. login right <laughs> like every single stupid thing you get you get rewarded for because people nowadays you can buy stuff there you can buy e money even crazier exactly you don't need to earn anymore just get your uh, money from your parents and exactly. you buy money in exactly GTA. as far and as i know exactly. I, I don't that, know but that's, how that's it what is. i heard that's how it is so people are trained that oh if i do something i want to get rewarded for it right away but here's the trick. Real life doesn't work like that. Yeah, the best true. things to achieve in life are things where the gratification is months, weeks, months, or even years down the line. But then it's sweeter. Exactly. So, for example, with fitness, right? It's like if I go to the gym once, I'm not going to see anything. If I go to the gym all week, I'm not going to see anything. Only when I hit it for a month, then I might see first results a little bit. Right, if you're in my coaching, it's faster. <laughs> exactly. And it's exactly the same with business, right? It's like it's like you can't just start a business and instantly make a ton of money. You're gonna have to work for it, and it's exactly that ability to delay gratification and still stick to a process, even though you don't see any results yet. That is the differentiating factor between people who never become successful and those that will. But in my opinion, uh, this is correct, absolutely correct, what you say. But it's good that what you mentioned now, what's happening. Uh, Hell in the yeah. It's good because it's less competition. It makes it easier for us. Ah, yeah. 100%. If, if you're on the right path, it's easier for you because uh, if most of the people quit after week number one, well, you have less. If everyone would have been like yep. a super crazy alpha, super achiever, I want to have all cherry trees and the best goat <laughs> and the best hotel. <laughs> hey, man, it will be harder for us, you know? Yeah. That's why... Um, uh, I, 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 people, I'm, I'm fine with this. Just chill, uh, <laughs> chill, <laughs> <boss>. Do nothing. <laughs> do nothing. Where Where do you want to live? Like you, you settle down with family, I suppose. With kids. I think you told me once you want to have a lot of kids and stuff. Like that. Where Where do you see yourself living? Cyprus down? for sure. So yeah, will be one spot. Beautiful. Um, I always my 
also clear i have always had a clear vision about us like you with the gold and then the cherry tree yeah. i had a clear vision that i want to have an apartment super crazy nice on a skyscraper with a sea view mm, achieved. my man yeah achieved how many years it was not one week not one month uh, it was several years mm. uh, now it's done it's finished and a house in the forest and a super beautiful landscape uh, in a forest when you can pick mushrooms and go fishing and so on mm. and it's also in process now it will be ready in two three years beautiful man. Uh, construction is going already for one year now the house will stand this year already mm. and then we will do landscapes interior and so on uh, i think about the cherry trees also yeah and, my man. Uh, yeah i will i want to do japanese style a little bit oh, there so yes. like japanese cherry trees and yes. bonsai yes it will bonsai. be done i have a clear clear vision there and uh in two years it should be ready so i always wanted to do like this um uh, apartment because i live in an apartment this was the highest apartment of europe <laughs> and i really like the view because sometimes you just work and then you look outside the yes. window you cannot imagine that you yes uh, the, the view is unimaginable mm. and i understood that i want exactly this mm. but with a sea view also mm. and this happened now mm. this i achieved and this i have and i want to have a house uh, in the forest so i'm working at it and it will come um, and I don't need more. I don't need more. It's so it can be so simple, right? Yeah. It's like it's the same for me. It's like I mean, it's not that simple. It's like super expensive, <laughs> but uh, and like uh, for example, the best architects and engineers are working on the house, and mm. here this is the best complex on the island, and so on. So it's not that simple, but. Uh, when I finish this project, I will need to find a new project, maybe in different spheres. Yeah. So, point of the matter is what I want to say is that it's years and years of working and projecting and planning so it's it's not coming overnight yeah it's not coming overnight i mean you also have these boot camps coming up that i see you post a lot and i really don't know much about it other than it's going to be for clients yeah what exactly is it and also you have two locations there right it will be connected with exactly ah. this one will be at the beach yeah. So here in Cyprus, and one will be at the forest. I cannot disclose the location yet. Yeah, yeah. But the one will be in the same location. So it will be in a beautiful nature park. It will be in a natural reserve park, and uh, there will be two locations for it. I have done boot camps already in the past. Uh, it was in Turkey, and what uh, is happening there is. I meet with my clients offline. We go train together. We go eat together. Nice. We go to the supermarket, take groceries. I give lectures about biochemistry, hormones, also some finance lectures I have done, personal finance for business. I have done lectures. So there are lectures basically every day, several lectures. We go train, we stay together and we push the week. So it's not, I have done it in Turkey, but this was hardcore. Yeah, it was not spa vacation. I mean, it's there was called forty lectures. Yeah, it was forty lectures per week. And I asked, yeah. I asked the people, maybe you want to have a rest day? That we go outside, <laughs> check some ruins or something, go fishing. They said no, more lectures, more lectures. <laughs> so, um, yeah, maybe I do not that hard uh, when I finish uh, constructions of these two, but um, point uh, of. Uh, what I want to do is this boot camps that we spend time together, but also I want to give maximum information. So uh, basically about hormones and biochemistry, like that uh, when clients come after this week, like their brain should explode. And uh, it's like a mini uh, university year in a week, basically. Damn. So man. this I have done in Turkey already with yeah. several clients, but because of Corona, it was hard to organize this anymore because uh, flight restrictions and so on and so on yeah I and i said okay uh, maybe during this time i reorganize and find even a better location and uh, i connected this to my personal projects that i want to live at the sea and in the forest and i said okay let's do two locations one at the beach and one in the forest mm, nice freaking happy when is it going to be done uh it should be the first ones should come next year yeah um and uh in the forest whenever it's ready so approximately in two years in the forest and next year at the beach 
Sick, man. Yeah. Well, that sounds like a lot of fun. Here's one question I wanted to ask you. Mm, I hear this recently quite a lot. It's a question about hormones. Okay. That a lot of older guys, older friends that I have, they're like in the 40s and 50s, fit guys, awake guys, successful guys. And they're like, oh, yeah, I'm on uh, TRT, mm-hmm. testosterone replacement therapy. Mm-hmm. Earlier you said you want to do everything natural, and the only reason why someone should take testosterone is if they're uh, an athlete. What about people that are in the 40s, 50s, where just n- testosterone naturally dips? Nine out of ten cases, TRT is not necessary to do. Maybe mm. even more than nine out of ten. Mm-hmm. TRT is the last option because as soon as you enter TRT planet, basically you sign a paper for the rest of your life. Yeah. You will be um, w- without the injection, you will not function anymore properly, <laughs> first. And second, the longer you're on it, and TRT is replacement therapy. You, in theory, you replace forever. Yeah. The harder it will be to control. So let's say you start TRT when 40 and you want to live until 110. So you have 70 years still of injecting. That's actually uh, a good point. 70 years, man. It will not work out. And the longer you're on it, the more potential side effects and harsher potential side effects you may get. Mm. Not to get these side effects. You need to supervise blood work. You need to do medical prophylactic analysis. You do need to do tests. You need to check your liver. You need to check your kidneys. You need to do ultrasound scans and so on and so on. So things get more complicated. Much easier it is just to naturally raise your testosterone levels. And as soon as the syringe comes in, side effects may happen which will throw off the natural hormonal balance. And then once you go off, it's very hard to restore it. And the older you are, the harder it is to restore. It's easier to restore after injections of steroids. When you're 25, yeah. it's easier to ins- uh, re- reinstall and restore than when uh, the guy is 45 or 55. Yeah. Still, imagine you're 50, you still want to live 50 years and you need to inject 50 more years. No, it's not going to work out. Mm. So now it's, of course, pushed by doctors because it's a quick fix. Yeah. But I don't recommend it. it. Also, uh, and they feel good about it. Of course, when you inject and you're 50, you feel younger right away and it works, but they don't see the long-term effects of it. Mm. And I don't recommend it. It should be the last option. It is an option for some, but it should be the last option. Before it, you need to optimize everything, see yeah. whether it uh, goes up and it should go up. I have clients who are 50 plus who have levels like 25 year olds. Damn. <laughs> and some 25 year olds, I know that are out there, they have levels of zero. Yeah. It's, it's so age so is so just, sad. in this case, age is just a number really. Mm. Of course, naturally over time it goes down. Yeah. But I mean, 50 is it's not that super old, actually. What What do you think about uh, stem cells? I've hear I've heard so much about people that are you know they have injuries. They say, "Yo, stem cells, go fly to um, Panama, get the stem yeah. cells in." It's uh, very good technology, mm. um, but the clinic that's doing it needs to be uh, it needs to have a very good reputation. Mexico and south america are very good places to do it because the regulations are not that strict Mm. as for example in switzerland for example in switzerland um a client of mine just uh, went for the stem cells and i advised because he has a back injury Mm. um i advised him to because he went to switzerland first and it's very expensive there's sixty thousand. i said this is Mm. too much uh, just go to this country, I said, in this clinic, uh, it was like 10,000 or something. Mm. But it needs to be a clinic that has a good reputation. Yeah. Because there there they can have lots of tricks. For them, 10,000 or 60,000 is a lot of money. Yeah. And they can inject you just water. You will mm-hmm. never know what you you're getting know. there. So you need to have a good reputation. You need, you need to know what you're getting there. Yeah. But in general, this technology is... Um, is very good uh, for cases like this, injuries and so on, yeah. for example. Yeah, that's good to know. Uh, wh- one thing that I also found super strange for my own progress, what is what is the, the, the connection between eating meat and having higher testosterone? 
for me, it was worlds in between. Once I started getting on on your diet that included un- unquestionably a lot of a lot of meat, and I even remember I messaged you. I'm like, yo, like how the hell am I gonna get to all these to this all this protein? And you're just like, well, eat this meat, eat that meat, and so on and so forth. But I don't understand the connection between it. What's the biochemistry behind that? Uh, it's very simple. In this case, uh, you get the building blocks for testosterone. So mm. testosterone is built from cholesterol. Mm. Your body is able to do cholesterol on its own because it's that important. From media and pharma and doctors, cholesterol um, is bad. Usually yeah. people think cholesterol is bad. But a man can just Google and see where testosterone is coming from. It is from cholesterol. So cholesterol builds your body. Not only testosterone, but cholesterol is an essential building block for your body. When you eat red meat, you get cholesterol. Yeah. So you just give the body the building blocks to build it. So your body does not need to spend energy to to build it because you just give it to it. Yeah. Um, to raise testosterone you need to be healthy because for your body to reproduce is not as important as surviving. Mm. So if your body is constantly producing stuff on its own and you're not giving it, it's like survival mode. Yeah. So testosterone will not go up that easily mm. even if mm. you need to get your body out of survival mode mm. and then testosterone with tricks, with good nutrition, with training, with lifestyle changes will go up. Yeah. Nowadays, most of the people out there, they eat junk food. Yeah. It's low density mineral low nutrient density for example red meat and organ meat is very high in minerals and very high in nutrients so you're giving very important building blocks to the body it can take it and uh, it's like lego stones and you can just build your castle yeah it's very hard and very energetic to build on its own for your body so it's like a constant survival mode so imagine nowadays a 25 year old just is junk is vegan and so on and so on. He gets no building blocks. Maybe his body is using resources from before that he has accumulated over the teenage years Mm. while he was eating meat and so on. And then when the capacity is uh, finished, when the resources are done, it will drop uh, drop to zero and that's it because body is in survival mode. So basically you give building blocks while going out of survival mode. So... Mm. How do people go into survival mode, for example, not eating properly, not giving nutrients, stress too much, yep. constantly stressing, not recovering, and so on and so on. So there's this connection, basically. Mm. I mean, yeah, that's how it was for me. Like, I became vegetarian and I felt great the first couple of years. I felt better. It's a creeping process. It's not like I'm vegan and now uh, exactly. if it's bad, I will die in one week. It's not working like yeah. this, obviously. I mean, I even remember for me, I started living much healthier at first because back then, I mean, that was 2009, um, most junk food was just with meat. Like nowadays, that's kind of like also one of the dangers. Like nowadays, you get the vegan burger, mm. you get the vegan pizza, you get the vegan freaking Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Like back in the days in 2009, the only junk food there was was kebab, pizza, burger. It all had meat. So when I stopped eating meat, I couldn't eat any of the junk food. So mm. I was kind of automatically living healthier because I had to eat just freaking vegetables all day. But the problem now is that, you know, if you're a vegan, you can eat all the junk food in the world. Mm. And that's, again, like the, 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 the media and all that jazz kind of like um, catering to that. And that and that messes up a lot of people. What I, am, what I found kind of interesting, because also earlier you mentioned, you know, that kind of blew my mind a little bit. Like when you're 40 and you're on, on TRT, you have 70 years of 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 taking injections and in my head i'm like when you're 40 your life is over anyways but you <laughs> you're right i mean 70 freaking years we get probably we get to live to 100 110 our generation how old May do you think more. how old do you think are people like us gonna get and the last five years there were like medical it was like landing moon landing what happened in the last five years uh, in medicine just uh, the normal people out there they don't know there are technologies now that have something to do with uh, genetic manipulation you can manipulate your genes and so on what happened in the last five years is just f- it's like the atomic bomb or something hmm. or like uh, moon landing or uh, some crazy stuff happened in medicine like Which, what, like what, what exactly? But it's why, why I say atomic bomb. I, I say as if it's like something positive. I say like depends how you use this 
atomic energy like yeah. the same with the techno this technology in medicine what's possible to do now no matter it matters how you use it because yeah. this technology is so crazy if you use it in a bad way well it will be atomic bomb if you use it in a good way well it will be let's say uh, energy plant or something well, so what are what are some examples like, i have no clue what 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 has happened the last couple of years in terms of advancements um so the most important in my opinion and also got nobel prize for it is the technology where it's possible to alter and manipulate uh, genes basically mm. so you can even before the child is born you can manipulate the child basically yeah so is that the, the crisp or crisper yeah, kind of thing right. yeah crisper cas19 uh, uh, it's crazy what you can do without it and it depends what you do and there are already some crazy crazy stories that that came from china where the underground scene is mm. hefty what they're doing there is obviously like crazy stuff some unethical stuff that how they're experimenting with it and so on uh, i cannot imagine what will happen in the next 10 years i mean what can happen it, it will happen let's say in 30 40 years maybe even there will be no mothers even like for rich people because it will be competition it's like fuck he tuned his kid so his kid is smarter i have mm. to do it too yeah. how can i make kids that not that smart and that beautiful so like rich people will start to manipulate and upgrade their kids even before they're born for example yeah. so it will be like competition so yeah. society will force them to to upgrade their kids for example mm. uh, it's hard to imagine what will happen. Uh, the kids will grow not in mothers, they will grow in containers, for hmm. example. Hmm. Uh, this has something to do with this technology also. And why maybe governments will push it? Because the mother, she will be able to work nine months more and pay mm. more taxes, for example. Damn. So where, where it's all rolling, um, I am really scared, to be honest, how it will be. Uh, and the more it goes into this direction, the more I appreciate that I just grew up uh, where I just went with my friends outside, played basketball, played PlayStation yep. and grew up a little bit without the Internet, a little mm. bit with the Internet. Yep. And now it's like in the Matrix. Kids are growing in containers, are genetically manipulated and so on and so on. And even let's go crazier when this all happens. I thought about it and I talked actually about all of this technology with one of the most known um, gynecologists. So he is doing female medicine. He has uh, lots of clinics and he is very recognized all over the world. And we talked about it. We drank a whiskey and we talked about it. Where, where, it, where it will go? Where, it's po where are the possibilities now that we can analyze in 2023? We uh, met actually a couple of weeks ago. We talked we, we talked with him a couple of weeks ago. Mm. And I told him, you know what? I told, there will be photographers who will specialize in this niche that will photograph women that where their child grows in a container or in another mother but will have the same genetics as the mother mm. just they will rent out mothers that yeah. will take out the genetics basically yeah. and there will be photographers who are, will specialize on taking pictures of the mother as if she's pregnant so wow. she will take a balloon so the kid can say can you show me pictures of your pregnancy time yeah so they will make fake pictures and put them on the shelf and say look here's your pregnant mother you're not a container kid yeah huh? yeah. what do you think about it <laughs> so we took it further and further and further we talked about this for hours and hours until like 2 a.m we talked about this and it was crazy what may happen hmm. and we come to the conclusion that it will happen. Mm. And the only reason why, because there will be competition. Yeah. Your neighbor left and right, if they're upgrading their kids, you're not upgrading your kid. Why? They have IQ 200 and your kid has IQ 130. Mm. You cannot allow it. Yeah. And this is sad, but this is where it's rolling. And this happened in the last five years, basically. But at the same time, I'm going to present a counter argument there. Where can humanity go? when the average person is just hell of a lot smarter what kind of planets can we go to what kind of advancements can we have technolo technologically what kind of 
what do we, what can we do as a whole, as a society, as a collective, when people are not fucking idiots? Another counter argument. You're absolutely right. This is theoretical. But let's say if this technology gets ex- accessible, it will not be for the family mm. in uh, Bangladesh. Yeah. So it will be, especially in the beginning, it will be a case of, uh, of people, people who can afford it. Yeah. And they will not allow, for example, this technology to happen to normal people and mm. so on and so on. So mm. it will be mm. just as usual, mm. just usual business. Yeah. It, uh, the probability of this uh, to turn out... Uh, good is lower than uh, turning out uh, bad <laughs> in my opinion i mean the neighbor kid already knows what's up it's, yeah, it's not genetically manipulated <laughs> from uh, <laughs> from crying but to get back to the original question i think we're gonna wrap things up so how long have we been talking now pretty much oh, <laughs> we said we got to two two hours i could talk like two more but no it's fine um what do you, how old do you think we can we can get you and i 100 plus certainly 100 plus could be anything 110 500 530 i what think do you think? 130 dang us 130 and let's I think, go and i think 120 130 i think yeah and i think with the new technologies like i said de- depends how you use it yeah but in theory i think even way more even 130 plus like 140 maybe that's beautiful even. man it's, that's it's, beautiful. it's possible you know it's because possible. i'm like i get to live 100 more years now do you have that too is like when you're 20 you think once you're 30 life is over when you're 30 you think once you're 40 life is over and so on and so forth and you know i the more people i am so blessed i meet so many people so many great amazing people including people like you but also a lot of people that are in their 50s and i meet people that are in their 50s and they're they're traveling the world. They're swimming with dolphins. You know, they're doing all these cool things. And I'm like, thank you for being 50 and still having an awesome life. Because in my head, with 50, I sit on my porch on a freaking grandma chair, uh, you know, drinking beer or something like that. <laughs> but then I see people in their 50s absolutely crushing it. So that's always beautiful, you know. But, uh, people in their people in their 60s and <laughs> 70s are still <laughs> doing crazy stuff. So you know, for a guy like me, I always want. I, I'm. Uh, I'm impatient. I want things always right away. I mean, at some point, you cannot do any more the physical stuff. When you're 80, you're 80, you cannot climb Mount Everest, most yeah, likely. Yeah. Then you transfer more to mental... Um, endeavors. Mental endeavors, yes. Yeah. Mental goals. You want to read more books. You want to whatever. But you cannot do surfing and climbing and going to Antarctica anymore, most likely. That's Actually, surfing probably surfing is not. I don't know. Hard. I never try. It's just an example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe yes. Surf- but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Surfing is one of the things I want to pick up when I'm like 50, because I, I imagine it's not hard on your joints. You know, it's not hard on your bones. It's just it's like flow. It's just maybe. like lungs. You just. It's just like skiing, maybe skiing. Yeah. Also, like 70 year olds do. Exactly. Yeah, maybe. yeah. I, I can imagine. So yeah, but in general, you are. Uh, you're not able to do any more what you were able to do at 20 and 30 when yeah. you're 80 and 90 physically. Yeah, sure. yeah. But uh, you can... Uh, nowadays, the longevity part, you can push it on like to 100. Even nowadays, like it's nothing special to be 100 plus, to yeah, be honest. True. So 110, 120 will be the new standard when we are old, maybe even more. And I think with the new technology, if you use it correct, in the correct way... Uh, uh, even more like maybe I'm, j- I'm just telling now spontaneous numbers but why not 140 150 yeah damn i mean this whole idea then uh, too of like uploading our consciousness into like robot bodies and stuff like that you know because we're limited by our well freedom. then it's unlimited but yeah. we are talking about like uh, real human <laughs> j- j- real s- still human not lizard you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i'll definitely build a lizard body one <laughs> I mean, 100 years from now, like 100 years ago, what, 1923, the technology was nothing. There were, like, there wasn't even airplanes yet in 1923, was there? When was the Wright Brothers? Uh, earlier, I think earlier. But, like, no commer- was there commercial air fli- er, airplanes already? 1923, al- already First World War was uh, finished and there were True, airplanes. true, true, true. Uh, but those, air- I mean, they had, like, the double-deckers and yeah, stuff. I mean, like, propeller machines. And now... You're in the sky in a freaking first class taking a shower, yeah. eating steak, 
you know, so 100 years from now, they're like, yo, sir, so you're, we calculated your physical body is going to be gone in about six months. What body do you want? You want to yeah, be, um, be a lizard, sir? I'm like, oh, hell yeah, give me the lizard body. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll be the uh, with the technology so people understand it will be possible to analyze where your weak spots Oof. in your genetics and eliminate them and this way you will be able to live much much longer so you take out the genetic components that are weak because mm. everyone has weak genetic components yeah. everyone will get sick here and there there are people that have chronic, uh, chronic problems with their liver because they have genetic predisposition like this yeah. and you will be able to manipulated eliminated and even in the future eliminated from your future kids so they yeah. don't have it there are already experiments like this there are some chinese researchers that already sit in jail for this there are some very interesting stories uh, from biochemistry and from this genetic ma manipulation what they have done uh and if like i said if you use this technology i mean you can increase by it's hard even to say by 50 maybe by yeah. 20 years by yeah. you it will it will be crazy and it will be like it it really likes the movie matrix you know the scene where neo he gets like this uh, flash drive where he can he like studies I know kung, kung fu, fu yes and so on yeah. so it, it will be the same you can like uh, maybe we, we talk about the photographer with a pregnancy but maybe yeah. it will be also there will be a marketplace for genetics mm. you want to have Elon Musk genetics oh uh, you need to pay this for your Let's kids go. so it will be like a mar market uh, like a marketplace for genetics maybe even yeah so yeah, if you want yeah. to have like maximum super crazy genetics for a kid uh, pay five million yeah yeah hell yeah so maybe who knows this technology allows to do it in theory yeah, you can eliminate genetic uh, weaknesses, <laughs> and you can in you can do whatever you want. You want blue eyes, you get blue eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, it's ethical. Uh, why it is forbidden now? Because no one knows the long-term consequence. Yeah. So, for example, now there are some Chinese that have done it that have manipulated the genetics of the kids, and if the kids get kids. What happens with their genetics? No, no. one knows. No one knows how yeah. the wave goes. Yeah. This is why it's very dangerous. Yeah. You. The ball is rolling. You don't know what will happen. Maybe there will be a lizard kid in three <laughs> generations. It's impossible to know. That's why it's so ethic. It's an ethical question. What we do with this technology? We have it. What do we do with it? In theory, you can eliminate genetic weaknesses, so you live on uh, 150 years. Mm. In theory, mm. if I get to live 150 years, that's 117 Formula One seasons that I get to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Lewis Hamilton's great grandson. You Do know? you remember back in the day, Michel Schumacher? <laughs> you know, just the, the games that Hideo Kojima are gonna is gonna bring out until then. The video games. His grandsons. His great grandson. Maybe he will also use the technology and he'll be, he'll just be like, "I'm the lizard old. Kojima. I'm, yeah. Here's my lizard game." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nicky Bra, man. You're a legend, dude. You too. <laughs> <laughs> Where can people find you if they're like, "Yo, I want to know more about you." Well, what's the what's the go-to place? Uh, the easiest is Instagram. Mm -hmm. It's Nikki Bra. Like Nikki this. Bra. Where's the camera? We're gonna we're gonna tag you. Yeah. We're gonna put your stuff website as well. Nikki Bra. Oh, but everywhere, Nikki Bra. Com. You just type Nikki Bra. Google everything. Yeah, I have YouTube. I have Instagram. I have my homepage. This is where you check everything. Shaka Laka, man. Well, it's been uh, a long term uh, goal to have you on the podcast. We finally made it happen. Uh, thanks a lot for your time. I always appreciate the hell thanks, out of that. Bra. Last words are yours. Well. Ah, last words. It was amazing. Uh, two hours flew like this, as if nothing, as we're just chilling in the in the living room, just talking about interesting stuff. I really enjoyed it. We, I hope you enjoyed it too. I think we have very interesting topics Hello. from Counter Strike to genetic manipulation. Uh, I think it does not get better than this. Agree. Namaste, GG, everyone. Bye bye. <laughs>